appreciate everybody that's listening to the recording. I'm going to say it was really cool to talk about what we talked about beforehand that they'll have no idea about. And if they'd really like to hear what's happening at Community Bible Church, they have to come in person. How's that? So we are now in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11, and we're calling this being put to the test. And we will talk about what that means in just a moment. Let's go to the Lord. Father, as always now, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Over the past uh, about two years, my son has been applying for different positions, and one of the first ones that he applied to before he got out of school required him in this particular organization to go through a bunch of tests. Uh, the first were, charged, were, were all about your physical endurance, your physical abilities, and so he went to this particular state, and what they said is if you get through the physical, then you're going to go through and take the, the written test, and then if you pass the written test, then you go to the verbal test, and then the, after you pass the verbal test, we decide whether we're going to hire you. So you may you have three chances to get eliminated, actually four. So he came to the physical test, and he got there, and of course, you know, they do the push-ups and the pull-ups and the sit-ups and all of that, but they had them sit down to do bench press, and just before that, Josh said he was watching this guy, and the guy had the weight, and they were supposed to bench a certain amount, which wasn't, if you work out, wasn't a massive amount. But the guy got down on the bench press, and if you've ever watched these guys work out, or you can watch them on YouTube, and they go, they try to lift too much, they go, and then it's, it's, their form is off, and you can hurt yourself. And so Josh said the guy went like this, and he went, and they said, okay, you failed, just like that, because his form was off. Of course, the guy was irritated, you know, and was like, I just got thrown out because I, because I moved one wrong way. Well, yeah, and if you knew what the organization was, you're probably glad that he did that, and they were that rigorous. I will tell you this, we all have tests in life. I don't know about you, I don't like them. I, I don't like tests growing up, you know. I was, some people like multiple choice tests. I like the ones that you could just write, you know. The multiple choice, I was like, I kept, you know, questioning myself. And we, but we would have tests in school. And I know people talk, well, you know, you should have this kind of test or that kind of test. But tests are important to check our knowledge. They, 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 they check what we know. And I don't know about you, but I sure am glad that the professionals like, well, the surgeons, you know, that they've passed their test. You know, the accountants and CPAs that are messing with my money that could keep me out of jail, not that I'm doing anything for the IRS, but, you know, you can make one wrong move. So I'm glad that they're there and they know what they're doing. And, you know, attorneys, that's another one. I sure am glad that I, I, I have these people that pass the bar because we've all seen these folks who go and get these, uh, the, these, these false doctors that are arrested for, you know, doing these procedures of uh, different kinds of lifts and facelifts and all those kinds of things. And the next thing you know, oh, wait, they weren't certified and they were never tested. Testing is not always a bad thing. In some ways, it's a good thing. Tests are important. Tests in life show us what we're made of. They shape our character. They check our knowledge. They, they, they help us to know what we can endure. Tests are difficult. And yet, you know what our response is to some of them sometimes? is like, why does God keep letting this happen to me? Why does, why does this stuff keep happening? I would just assume that I don't have to do this and I could just go about life. And yet, you and I both know that in the struggle, our story is actually manifested. In every, in every story, as we've talked about before, the hero goes on a journey and the hero has to overcome some type of a struggle. God has us in life becoming our own hero in a sense that we are on this journey and we will have to overcome struggles in life to accomplish the purpose and the plan that he's called us to. But tests are no fun. What we're tested every day, aren't we? Then, <laughs> you think about it. Society tested right? Society will test you. Test your values. It tests your beliefs. It tests your endurance. It tests everything. Yourself is sometimes just tested as a person. You know, you may have had that this morning when you were rushing to get to church and the person in front of you was slow. You know, you may be tested in your career. We were just talking about some of our elected officials and stuff before. Your, your medal is tested every time you go to a meeting or every time somebody says something negative about you. You're tested. Society tests us, our, our, and, our, and our own self, we're tested at times. And the question is, what do we do when we are put to the test? How do we actually effectively deal with it? Well, if you think that you should get past a test, let me say to you, 
You shouldn't because even Jesus was tested. Even Jesus was tested. But how he handled it was quite interesting. And that's the story that we're going to look at. And we'll come back to how do we do this in just a little bit. I want to get to the setting, though, in Matthew chapter 4 of what's happened. Jesus has just been baptized. Now, unlike the baptism that we will do at the beach uh, in a few weeks, and we'll be going to be announcing that, I doubt very seriously that after you're baptized and you go under the water and you come back up, that all of a sudden a dove is going to fly down and the, God, the heavens are going to open and God is going to say, this is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. If, it does, if he does, I'm out of the water and you're in charge. Okay, Because that's what happened to Jesus. Jesus was baptized. And, and remember the story, as he came to John to be baptized, John looks at him and says, I'm not, I'm not worthy to tie his shoelaces. And he says, I, I, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, John, this is how it has to be. And as soon as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens open up, a dove descends, and God says, could you imagine being there? This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Wow. Declared to be the very son of God by God himself. And then it happens. Matthew chapter 4. Some translations have immediately. Immediately, some of them say, and that's there. Then, right after that, Jesus, watch this, was led by the Spirit, i.e. God, the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What? Oh, wait, whoa, 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 wait a second. I thought God didn't tempt anybody to evil. I thought, I thought that's, not, I thought that's not, that, not how this happened. So let's break this down for a minute because this is still part of the important setting before we look at everything else. Here's what happens. After Jesus is baptized, literally the Spirit of God takes him by the hand and leads him in the wilderness, and it could say where he is going to be tempted by the devil. Not just to be tempted, but he's led into the wilderness where he is going to be tempted by the devil. But it was the Spirit of God that leads him into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness wasn't like when I grew up and my uncle had his hunting camp out in the Everglades. We still had some running water and swamp buggies and that kind of stuff. And you could still, there was still places to eat and drink. And, you know, it was kind of like a quasi-camping. I mean, it was no Holiday Inn, but it certainly wasn't like the desert. But the, the desert that they're talking about was hot in the day, cold at night, very little food other than some of the plants that were around, and little water. I don't know if you've ever been in the desert. You know, I, I went one time, I had to go to Phoenix, Arizona to a conference, and my wife said to me, she said, it was January, she says, it's, it's gonna get cold. I said, Pam, it's the desert. It's not going to get cold. It's hot. Every time you open up Phoenix, 112 degrees, you know. And if people in Phoenix, I don't know if you've ever been there or you've, you've lived there, you know people in there, they always say, it's, yes, but it's a dry heat. And I go, your oven's dry, okay? It's hot. <laughs> so I'm thinking we're okay, you know. So I go out there, and sure enough, in the day, I'm thinking, man, this is hot. This is hotter than Florida. I'm going to be back home, you know. And I'm talking away, and all of a sudden, we go in into this conference. I come back out to go with the people to eat. I'm wearing short sleeve shirts. I walk outside. It's dark, and it is cold. And I went, what? This is the desert. She was right. Now I know why I'm Bonanza and all those Western shows, those guys were always by the, you know, by the fire at nighttime in leather jackets. I'm thinking it's the desert. But the desert had extremes. There was extreme heat and extreme cold and extreme hunger and extreme thirst. It was the wilderness. And so if you understand something about the wilderness, the wilderness experiences of the people of God were always always, always transformative in some way. The place of solitude, the place of silence, the place of being alone. Remember the Israelites wandered for 
40 years in the wilderness because of their own doing. Remember Elijah was taken out into the wilderness after being on Mount Carmel and he saw the big victory and boom, out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he traveled to Horeb, the mountain of God. But he had to go through the wilderness first. The wilderness was a place of testing. The wilderness is a place of hunger. The wilderness is a place of loneliness. The wilderness is a place where you, where you can get stuck if you're not careful. And so here he says, immediately after this victory, immediately after he's declared to be the Son of God, the Spirit leads him to the place of extreme heat and extreme cold an extreme hunger, an extreme place of dependence where it's going to be he and God. And here's what I want to say to you. Watch out. Because if you've just had a huge victory, the wilderness is probably coming. If you've, if you've had, if you've had some, some place when you are now hungry and you're angry and you're lonely and you're tired, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment, the wilderness is coming and temptation is right around the corner because it says that he was led out into the wilderness where he will be tempted by the devil. Now you say, but wait a minute, you're talking about testing. Well, let me clear that up too. The word tempted there can be translated either way. It actually means test. Context determines and purpose determines whether it's going to be a temptation. The word is used all through the scriptures as test. So he sends him out to be tested and as always at their most vulnerable point. Satan takes the test and the enemy comes and it literally becomes a solicitation to do evil. Because that's when the enemy hits. When you are hungry and angry and lonely and tired, he comes right there. And notice what happens. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? No, duh. We missed breakfast and go, man, I'm hungry. We missed breakfast and let you go, man, I've been eating all day. I gotta get it. 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And all of a sudden, you hear the door creak open. And there he is. The tempter came to him and said, the tempter came at him and said, if you are the son of of God, tell these stones to become bread. Wow, that's going for the jugular, don't you think? Vulnerable, hungry, in the wilderness, the place where the Spirit of God led him. And he says, all right, now, if, if you really are who you say you are, now how did Satan know he was a son of God? Because God had just declared it. 40 days and 40 nights, 41 days before. He heard him say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well placed. And Satan comes, and I'm sure it's done in almost a whisper. And he goes, hey, listen, if you're really the son of God, because, you know, you've just spent 40 days here and 40 nights in this wilderness, and you're alone, and, you know, I mean, you're hungry. And after all, if you're the son of God, you can take these stones and turn them into bread. Now, I don't know about you, I'd be going, I'm going to have a Big Mac right about now because I'm hungry. And yet, you, have the, you have the ability to, to materialize this food right in front of you. Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes out of the mouth of God. L literally, Satan, Satan challenges his dependence on God at that moment to provide. It's a provision of the Father. He says, listen, uh, Satan, you're telling me to do this, but guess what? This is not how we live. We, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. My dependence is upon God. And Satan's like, hmm. Probably scratches his head and he says, All right, well let's 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 do another let's do another thing here. Let me let me try something else. So now it says, Then the devil took him 
to the holy city and in him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now let me just make a little contextual observation here. We don't know if they literally walked up to the temple, if they were transfigured there, if he had some kind of a vision where he could see it. We don't know exactly how this happened. But he has him stand on the highest point of the temple, and he says, this is great. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Now, notice what Satan does. First time, take these stones and be made, make them into bread, right? And what did Jesus say? It's written... He comes back to him with the scripture. So Satan says, well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And then he says, because it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Did you catch that? He takes this, and he distorts the truth now. It's great. What a... It's perfect. It's a perfect strategy. He... Jesus does this, Satan does that. He says, you're hungry? Jesus says, man doesn't live by every, but man, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of, of God. It is written. And so Satan goes, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down because it's written, he's going to protect you. You've, you've heard this before, haven't you? Listen, if, if he really loves you, If, if he really loves you, just go ahead and do it. Because God's, God's not going to keep that from you, right? It's okay. If, if he really loves you, he's not going to let that happen. So what, it's a distortion of the truth. By the way, you want to see how Satan doesn't change? The enemy doesn't change? Go back and read in Genesis 3. Same thing happens. Has God really said you can't eat of every tree of the garden? No, never said that. He said, you can't eat of every cheese. But, and, and then she says, yeah, but, but he said we couldn't even touch it. God never said that. And then, and then Satan says, and because God only knows that when you eat of it, you're going to be like him and you're going to know good and evil. And so same thing he's doing to Jesus now. He comes in and he says, yeah, he's going he's to take care of you, so just do it. Because after all, isn't that what's written? He takes the scripture and he pulls it out of context. How many times have we seen that? And so Jesus takes it. And says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He's like, hey, Satan, remember, you're you and I'm me. And while you're saying it's written that he's going to do this, you're putting God to the test. Don't do it. That's the truth. Doesn't matter how you feel. Doesn't matter what you think. This is the truth. Now, here's, here's the problem. You know, when you start talking about truth today, we, are op we operate in the area of feelings. Well, I, I, just, I, I just don't feel like he'd do that. I saw this happen recently in an event in our city. There was a, a thing that happened that shouldn't have been done. And I kept telling my friends who were going to be challenging this thing, I said, the narrative of the evening will be the ends justifies the means. In other words, we got to what we needed to do to take care of this situation. How we did it, yeah, we didn't follow procedure, didn't follow protocol, but it's okay. Do you know that's exactly what everybody did? They, and, I'm, and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, how messed up are we? Because truth is not truth anymore. You know, two plus two is four. Well, I mean, I feel like it could be six. Maybe eight. What goes up must come down. That's truth. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. But he's challenging the truth. And he distorts it. So as he comes at him one more time, verse 8. Again, now notice what's happened. It's the stones. It's the temple, the religious part, and now he's here. Again, now the devil took him to a very high mountain. I love this. And showed him all... All the kingdoms of the world with their splendor. So, we, again, is it a vision that he's given him? But he's up there saying, look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and look at this. And he says, all this I will give you. What? The devil, Satan says, I'm going to give all of this to you. Like, as if it's his to give. Here it is. If you'll bow down and give your allegiance worship me. You give your soul to me. You know, Jesus 
the kingdoms that you're allegedly in charge of, it, all the political kingdoms and all the religious kingdoms are going to be fighting you soon, and your time in the desert is going to look like a cakewalk because you know what's coming. And if, if, you'll just, if you'll just worship me, you won't have to go through that. If, 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 if you'll just fulfill your own desires for safety, for your own protection, for your own self-interest, and for your own good, Everything will be fine. And all you got to do is swear your allegiance to me. Wow. You mean I won't have to go through the pain of the cross? You mean I'm, I'm not going to have people turn their back on me? You mean I'm not going to have the people that are closest to me sell me out? You mean, I'm going to be in charge of how this operates if you, you give this to me? This is what's going to happen? I could, I could get out of this and I'm going to be okay? By the way, Judas was given that same opportunity. And I love, I love how Jesus responds. Here it is. Away from me. I love the King James better. Get thee behind me. Doesn't that sound better? Doesn't sound more authoritative about getting behind me? But he goes, get away from me. Like I kept telling the cat this morning, I don't know what was wrong with my daughter's cat, but I kept, get out of here. Get away. Quit meowing at me. Get out, you're irritating. So he goes, away with me, Satan. And then he says this, for it is written, there it is again, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Notice what happens. The then. Then the devil, the enemy, left him. Now watch. And angels came and tended to him. Did you, do you remember the second temptation? The second temptation was what? Throw yourself down and his angels will keep you from dashing your foot against the stone. He was partially right. Except now in this moment, I can imagine Jesus just collapsing after the emotional weight, the toll, the hunger, the loneliness, the sadness, the resistance that it took. Because remember, he was human. He, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus was at all points, and he uses the word tempted, you can put tested, was at all points tested just as we are, yet without sin. He, he got it. But what did he do to resist this? You've got notes, you've got three points, and I couldn't help myself, they all begin with T. If you and I want the keys to really pass the tests when they come their way. We've probably, you've probably already figured out what some of them are because I've alluded to them. There, there are three areas that we need to be operating in, three keys, if you will, to, to pass these tests and put the tests to rest. So here they are. Number one is trust. See, here's the thing. Jesus trusted the Father implicitly. It was the Father that led him by his spirit into the wilderness. And you know what it was? If you look at verse 11, it was the Father that led him, the Father that was with him, and the Father that held him in the end when it was all said and done, that ministered to him. The problem is sometimes we don't trust God because we can't see everything. So the test comes, and the first thing we do is we question and go, why are you letting this happen to me? And he's like, but, 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 but I've got you. I know, I know it's a wilderness, and I know it seems very difficult, but just take this step by Yeah, but why are you doing this? If you loved me, you wouldn't allow me. We start to buy into those lies. You wouldn't let this happen to me. I'm, man, if you've got kids, there's stuff that happens. I, 
the most frustrating thing for me was all the times I tried to protect my daughter and I couldn't be there at the moment that she broke her leg. And there was nothing that I could do but, but to be there and to hold her hand when they set her leg and they couldn't give her any pain medication. And I had to be there with her. But guess what? I couldn't stop the pain. I couldn't do anything to save her leg. But I was there holding her hand. Sometimes we go through that. And you know what? Today, that was the most difficult time of her life. And I'm going to tell you, she is stronger today because of it. But testing hurts. And it's going to test whether you trust God. Because the first person that we blame when the testing and the pain and the temptation comes, is the person that we need the most. That's what the enemy was doing with Jesus. Really? If you're really the Son of God, turn it into food. If you're really the Son of God, He's really protecting you and all this kind of stuff, you could throw yourself down, and guess what? He's going to protect you, so do it. And really, really, he's going to let you go through this whole cross thing for these people that are going to turn their back on you? Really? You're going to do all of that? You can worship me and you can, don't have to go through any of that. Trust. Trusting him is difficult. It's nothing, though, to trust God in the good times. It's nothing. That's a, that, hey, 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 God, you're on my side. All of a sudden we say, hey, something great happened. God bless me. When something bad happens, we go, God left me. He doesn't leave you. We only think he left us. The question is, can we trust him? Number two is you and I have got to operate with the truth. You know what I love about what Jesus said? It is written, it is written, it is written. He kept coming back at him with the scripture. Can I tell you this? Context is everything. When it comes to reading the scriptures, context is everything. But do you know context is everything in life? You ever notice when you, the, I told you all a few weeks ago what happened, people get out cameras when there's an accident, and they're like, oh, I'm filming, look at what happened, look at what happened. No, no, you don't have the context of what's going on all around you. You gotta have context. That's why they have to have talked to a witness here, and a witness here, and a witness over here, and a witness over here, to finally get the context of what was really going on. And often what you think is a context is not what it was supposed to be. And you can't interpret an event, the scriptures, or anything else without the proper context. And contextualizing takes time. Jesus put it back in the context. It says, Satan says it's written, and he goes, yeah, but boom. We have got to operate in the truth. Not only the truth of scriptures, but the truth in our lives. We get ourselves in trouble when we don't tell ourselves the truth and we don't tell other people the truth. Now, I'm not talking about tell the truth and handle it. You know, one of those things. Truth is a defense. So you can say whatever you want in any way that you want. That's not it. But truth is important, especially when the tests come. That's why Jesus said, it's written. It's written. It's written. It's written. And he kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back. And that's why we've got to know the scriptures. That's why it's so important to be familiar with the story. I'm not saying memorize the verses and all of that, but understanding the principles, it's so important. That's why we're starting this series about what you think Jesus said. Because everybody, especially in the political environment we're in today, everybody claims to have Jesus, you know. Jesus was a Republican, Jesus was a Democrat, Jesus was a, he was a Libertarian, Jesus wasn't anything, and, you know, we could make, everybody's, all of a sudden, the government for years didn't want Jesus anywhere around, now everybody wants him on their side, you know, everybody's claiming him now. And really, the fact of the matter is, he's not any, on any of those sides, he doesn't, is not worried about this kingdom here, or a kingdom over in the Middle East, as much as he's concerned about his kingdom and us being who we're supposed to be. That's the truth. But it's important for us to know the truth so that we know how to respond when the testing comes. Finally, you're not going to like this one. Because I, I, wish, I wish I could tell you that there was a magic formula. Oh. Here it is. Tenacity. Guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to resist. Isn't that great? Yes, it is means that you're going to have to dig down deep and trust God in the middle of the test to keep going. Jesus had 
to keep going. Regardless of how he was feeling, regardless of all of that, we operate on our feelings so much today. And I'm not saying feelings aren't important, but have you realized that the whole emotional intelligence thing today is all about us putting our feelings in check and making sure that we know how to respond? You can no longer say in the workplace, well, that's just my temper, get over it. And the boss goes, yeah, you're fired. You, you have to resist. There's no other way around it. And by the way, do you know there's now brain research that shows that when you are trying to overcome a bad habit, that the first time you resist, it's hard. And the second time, it gets a little bit easier. And it gets a little bit easier. And it gets a little bit easier. Last night, my wife and I were up at the Hillsborough Inlet. And she said to me, um, why don't we stop there and get coffee? Now, there was a place called Dandy Donut. Now, I've, I'm, I'm down 29 pounds right now, and, I'm, and Dandy Donut has really, really good coffee, but Dandy Donut has something else that I would stop by and get. In fact, I would get two of them. I would go in and get an apple fritter, and I would get a sugar twist. Now, just for the uninformed, the apple fritters are a minimum of 450 calories. I have no idea what's in the sugar twist. So, of course, I go in to Dandy Donuts to get the coffee, and I go in, and she's in the car on the phone, and I look, and guess what's sitting right there? I love, they usually had it on the bottom, like over here. No, no, it's at Bob's eye level. And the apple fritters, like you could, they were that big, and you could see the glaze on them. And you can see the chunks of apple. Am I making you hungry? And I'm looking at this going, okay, can I just have my coffee? Can we do this quickly? Then we got out and, and something was wrong with the coffee and I had to go back in. <laughs> Fortunately, that wasn't the first time I've had to resist that in the midst of all of that. So guess what? Last night it was a little bit easier. A little bit easier. It's one thing to resist food, but other things... Sometimes we just have to dig down and keep going, regardless of how we are feeling, because truth is truth. And see, in those moments, we think he's left us. We think, we think we're alone. We think, we think we're, we, we can't do it. And suddenly, when it's over, he's got his angels there. I don't mean, by the way, you know, the, the term angel can be a divine being. In this case, I believe that it was. But do you know that angel is also translated messenger? It seems to me that in those moments when I've finally exhausted and I'm ready to give in and I'm ready to give up and I'm ready to say I can't do this, that God at that moment sends somebody to tell me you're doing okay. You're going to be all right. You're going to make it. And you know what? I'll even walk with you if you need be. Tests are going to happen in life. I don't, I don't know what you're facing right now. You know what the tests are. You know what the struggles are. You know what the things are. You know where your weak spot's at right now. And by the way, not only your weak spot, you've got to watch your strength because when your strength is overused, it can become your greatest weakness and Satan will hit you there too and cause pride and all that kind of stuff. You know where those areas are at. So let me ask you, what is, what is, what is the enemy whispering right now? Has God really said? No. He's unfair. He just doesn't want you to be like him. And on and on it goes. God has provided a way to deal with the testing. If we will but just look at and understand the truth, trust him, understand the truth, and just keep on going when we feel like giving up, we'll be able to put all the tests that come our way to rest and become all that he wants us to be. Let's pray.